Hello and welcome to RJ Sanderson TV, the fourth episode for 2021 and we're coming off the back of the federal government's budget from last week. Dave Kennedy is my name, joined as always by Roy Sanderson. Hi Dave, great to be here again. Roy, uh, largely, your thoughts on the budget for 2021? Overall, I gave it a bit of a tick. I think there was lots in there, lots of money being spent, building for jobs. So a couple of things I don't like that we'll come to later, but really a good, uh, certainly positive rating from my angle. Today on RJ Sanderson TV, we're going to look at most of uh, the, the, uh, the big measures from the budget. We're going to go through them in detail. But before we get there, Roy, uh, in the last month, Carlton and Essendon, they did play. The Blues got the chocolates, but we're both three and six. Th those, are, those are two numbers that I wanted to bring up quickly off the top. Football. We we'll start with football. It's, yes, a couple of big weeks ahead of it for both teams, I think. We, we always start with footy. But now let's get into our news headlines and look at some other numbers because, as, uh, as many people would have seen in the headlines, the budget for 2021 was delivered last week. And here's what it looked like from a numbers perspective. The deficit has increased. It went from $85.3 billion last year to $161 billion this year. So... This is a budget that is going to um, inject more money into the economy and create bigger debt and a bigger deficit. Uh, but essentially, the message is more money into the economy and bigger deficit. Is this what's required at this point in time, Roy? Well, it's certainly what Josh Frydenberg believes the economy needs. He's given away any uh, idea of a surplus for at least five years and possibly longer, and he won't be drawn on when the surplus might arrive. So a uh, bit of a change from what had happened pre-COVID. Now, you can see in those uh, right columns, as, as you mentioned, the forecast there, forecast for the deficit to decrease over the next four to five years, but also just the, the, the theme of estimates is something that forecast that I want to bring up because I think there's a lack of accountability to those, but I want to bring that up uh, later in the show and, um, and talk to you more about that. But, Roy, let's get into some of the, uh, some of the, the measures, starting with individuals, the low to middle income tax offset, has been extended uh, and you can see here that the sweet spot, as you call it, Roy, between 48,000 and 90,000 is where people are going to get the, the maximum offset. Yes, and this is just an extension of a policy that already existed. So they're just going to continue this for another 12 months. And this is a tick from me. This gives people a bigger refund. It's a lump sum payment. It can help with a holiday registration on your car, pick up the rent if you're behind. So I, I'm in favour of this one. What, why does it start at 48000 Or why, does, why do people who earn 48000 get more than people who earn less than 48000 uh, That That belies logic. And I argued against that from the when they first introduced it. I believe it should have been given to everybody um, up to a certain income. I would not have given less money to those that need it who earn less than forty eight thousand. It just does. It's not logical. And particularly, I think we talk about um, on this program a lot the virtuous cycle of the economy. We know that um, the way the economy works is that um, when people spend money, it filters back through the economy in a positive way. And we know also that people who earn less money are more likely to have to spend that money. They can't simply sit there with the money and save it because they need to pay their bills. They need to, you know, they, 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 have a, uh, um, they spend um, a higher rate of their discretionary income than, than people who earn more money. So, as you say, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Yeah, and it's quite possible that the people between the 90000 and the 126000 when they get that extra money, even if it's sliding down on a sliding scale... Um, they're likely to pay off debt rather than go out and say, oh, I've got a bit of money, extra money, I'll go and spend it. So that's, I understand your point. And, and that, obviously, uh, uh, as we say, that, that's probably the opposite of uh, the virtuous cycle of the economy. If, you know, if, if money is being injected into, the, um, into, the, uh, into individuals' pockets and they're not spending it, that's not a good result and that's not what the Treasurer is ordering with this particular piece of policy. But... We mentioned that this is an existing piece of policy that's been extended. There's another one that affects businesses. It's the asset write-off, and uh, that is another thing that allows um, full expensing of, uh, for eligible businesses with an annual turnover of total income of up to $5 billion. So basically, if they buy an asset, they can write off the cost. You can t talk through the specifics of it, Roy. Yeah, again, um, what they've done here is they've made the expenditure unlimited. So there's no limit on what you spend. And there was a time when it was limited to 150000 So this is about making or giving the incentive to go out there, spend a lot of money on equipment, and that could actually 
open the door for some tax planning before June 30. Because if you go and spend extra on equipment and claim the full cost in this tax return and you create a loss in your books, you can claim back any tax or some tax that you paid the prior year. So it's called loss carryback or clawback. So this is a good thing and opens tax planning for everybody, everybody in business. So just on that, you talk about tax planning. You know, what, how does that look for you know, someone who runs a small, medium enterprise who's, who, who sees this and sort of thinks, oh, I'm a small business, I'm a medium business, I know that I can do something, but I'm not quite sure what I'm doing, what I can do. When they come and see you, what, what, what are some of the things that you'd talk to them about? So we would start by looking at what their profit is to, the, for, to date, before June 30. Uh, look how close they are to paying tax or not paying tax. And if they're paying tax, we'll have a whole hit list of things that they might do so that they can reduce their tax. But never spend money on things that you don't need because your tax rate is, let's say it's 30%. If you spend $1,000, you save $300. So only buy what you need. But that small to medium-sized business might actually be on the, on the fence. Do I go out and buy the new tables? Do I go out and buy that new photocopy or that piece of equipment that I sort of need? While well, there may be an incentive to do it before June 30 so that you can claim some money back or some tax back that you paid the prior year. Uh, keep in mind, this applies to cars, but cars do have a limit on what you can claim, uh, which is 59,136. So you can spend 60,000 on a car, you still get to claim the whole 59,136 on it, and the balance isn't depreciated, it just sits in the asset list until you sell the vehicle. So I suppose the message there, as you say, is you actually need to know what your tax liability is going to look like. So you, that, that's why you call it tax planning, isn't it? Because you, you need to know what your tax liability is for the end of 2021 FY um, to, to understand whether you should go out and purchase something. Correct. And today's uh, bookkeeping where we're using Xero or Myob, which is all online and live with bank feeds, we should be able to pull up some figures and within a very short time know where your profit is, know what your tax position is. The old days where it was all manual and you get to the end of the year and then you give it to the accountant and six to eight months later you find out what your profit was, they are gone. No business is going to operate or survive under the old rules. How difficult is it for you guys around this time of the year, Roy? Because we're seeing all these changes to rates and we're ch seeing changes to scales and different you know, tax offsets, tax uh, concessions, etc. How difficult is it for you guys to implement this? Uh, it's true that there's a lot of reading uh, that comes across our desk to stay up to date with things. In our organisation, we're quite fortunate that we share resources across 10 locations and all our team, you'll have emails going out and say, oh, I just discovered this. Now, as if I was a sole trader, or a very small accounting firm, it'd just be impossible to keep up. So we're a little bit fortunate that way, but it is a great time of the year for us. We love tax planning because we're telling businesses how to save money. It's a great part of our job. Uh, like we like mentoring and those sort of things, again, a very good part of the job. The uptake on Job Trainer hasn't been fantastic to, to this point and uh, it looked as if at some stage, or there was speculation that it wouldn't continue, but it has been extended, Roy. Yeah, we thought they'd get rid of it because the uptake has been very small. Um, it seems that either people, businesses are not understanding it or the requirements are too onerous for businesses to take advantage of it. But they've given it a little bit of extra time and we'll, we'll, I think it's a case of watch this space. Have you had any of your clients um, use the scheme? Yes, we have across our, our network in one of those emails across a big group of our, our team. I did see that uh, somebody did complain about how onerous it was to get it all applied for. Right. Apprentices is another area very similar, but the wage subsidy scheme has been increased as well. $2.7 billion invested in that. And again, another um, way that you can, uh, or another, another way you can apply to have a uh, you know, apprentices join your organisation. And this, this is a good policy and it's not difficult. It's going through the people who put out apprentices, so various boards and uh, companies that do that, and you get 50% of the wage paid for 12 months. Now, when they extended it, you still only get 50% of the wage for 12 months. They haven't extended how long you get that wage subsidy for. They've just extended the application time and uncapped it as well. So I think... Um, I think it's a very good thing and given that there are some labour shortages right now in the construction industry, they're finding it very hard to get labour, um, I think this would be great. What I would love, and here's an idea for the government or Josh when he comes and talks to us, um, extend the apprenticeship rebate to other areas. Office, call it office apprenticeships, call it hospitality apprenticeships. 
full time, not casual. And if you can extend that, uh, not just the apprenticeship, which is seen as blue collar construction, but extend it across other industries, I think you'd get a fantastic take up. I think that the, uh, the photo opportunity doesn't look as good as uh, when you're in the, the hard hat on the construction site, Roy. Just someone sitting behind a computer, the photo up doesn't look, look as good for, for, for Treasury and for Mr Frydenberg. But I, I see your point there and um, it is interesting that you talked about there being a job shortage there. And it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about this massive unemployment rate, the prospect of giant unemployment. And, you know, we've got skill shortages in certain areas as well. Yes, and they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are some industries still suffering. It travel, hospitality hasn't bounced back completely, um, but there are certainly job shortages. And partly, partly the reason is because we don't have people coming from overseas. So the people who would float from hospitality venue to hospitality, fruit pickers, we just don't have them because they're not, there's no holiday makers. Women have been a, a group of people that have um, largely been seen as benefiting from this budget. And the childcare rebate is perhaps designed in, in, in large part for, for women to get back into the workforce. So obviously, the, this is talking about for, you know, for, for parents in general, but most, uh, most parents that are the, the carers of children are women in Australia still. Um, and this one, the childcare rebate is going to allow another 40,000 individuals to work an extra day per week. Good, good investment? Yeah, it good is. investment. Um, it, we've already been had numerous emails saying, what if I've got one child? It's only if you've got two children or more that you get that extra day. And bear in mind the fine print, it does not come into play until 1 July 2022. The other, another area that has been... Um, uh, targeted in this budget is superannuation um, and changes to superannuation and we've seen changes to the superannuation guarantee which probably affects um, you know superannuation in general is usually a topic that we talk about in the context of older people but perhaps this uh, super guarantee is one we talk about in the context of younger people because it means that people who earn uh, $450 a month previously were not um, their employers were not forced to pay super but now there is no uh, threshold to that. You have to pay super on any earnings. It's interesting that uh, the last budget, the government got hammered because the, the response was there's not much in this for females. They have flagged this policy as affecting more females than males, so they've put the female hat on it. But the reality is that um, what used to be if you earned 450 or less, you didn't have to super paid or you didn't get, have to pay super for your staff. That's now changed and it's from whatever you pay on wages, you're paying super. So people who work part time in hospitality, maybe McDonald's people just earning, working a few shifts a week, um, they're now going to have super paid and that could have a really big impact when they, these young people get to retirement in many years to come. And perhaps that's why there's no one, you know, bashing down the door that, you know, from, from the younger community or for, from, you know, from the younger demographics because, I mean, I, I, I consider myself still young, Roy, at 30, and, you know, super's not, not necessarily the thing that's at the forefront of your mind. You, you're more interested in that low middle income tax offset, bang, we've got the, the, the 1080 in the account as opposed to, uh, you know, worrying about super that's going to be an issue in 30 to 40 years. But... Uh, we spoke off air just before about you know super and women and, and and how the government can improve that situation, particularly as we know relationships that you know have been going on for many years that might have operated with one person at work and one person at home. How you bridge the gap when those relationships end and you know there is some sort of um, you know there's there's a you know a massive gap in the in the superannuation accounts of of both people and one thing that was touted as an example was that super should be paid on uh, paid parental leave that's paid by the government now that wasn't included in this budget um, but you've got some thoughts on you know how you can yeah. bridge the gap in super yeah again for when Josh Frydenberg joins us <laughs> a cut another policy I'll put to him. We've got a long, long, long <laughs> list of questions for the Treasurer for when he joins us. It will be a special edition of RJ Sanderson. It will, be a, it will be a special edition. Um, my theory is that because women tended to have time off throughout their career to have children, and that's just a fact of life, whether it's good or bad, it's the reality. Maybe when you've got contributions going into super, you can actually split the super. Because right now, super is very separate to individuals. Um, but if you're in a relationship... I believe you should be able to um, lodge a form to say, I want my super shared, so that any contributions are splitting between both parties. And I think that would make it more equitable for women who get the 
card that says you're staying at home and having less income and therefore you're going to have less super when you retire. And that just might even, even the scale up a little bit. And of course, pe you know, people would be you know, wanting to make sure that they still maximise the equity from their super by having one account with just joint owners because obviously if you split the accounts you miss out on the benefit of compounding interest or, or that type of thing. But having one account with a, with a high equity value could benefit, uh, benefit everyone in that situation. Yeah, and yet less fees as well. If yours is with an industry fund, certainly less fees. Um, with a self-managed super fund, the fees are fixed with a self-managed super fund no matter what you've got in them. Uh, but yeah, I think it'd be a real benefit, be a good policy. Downsizers, uh, people at the other end of life uh, that we talked about, 60 to 65, uh, or 65 to 60 in this case, um, this, is, this is one that will have a big effect. This is a good policy because at 65, it was maybe a little bit too restrictive. Anybody from 60 and above and are planning their retirement can now downsize by selling their home to buy a, a lower value home and they are permitted to put up to 300 or 600 per couple into superannuation because there's caps on super. And the reason this is good is because we want to encourage people to put money into super before retirement because all the money in super at retirement from that point forward is tax free. There you go. And speaking of tax free, it uh, gets us to the concessional caps, which have changed. Uh, first time for a while, you know, they've just been indexed uh, 25,000 to 27,000. Um, first time since July 2017 that we've seen this increase. Is it enough? Should, should they have done more? Uh, it was. The first year they brought it in, they brought it in at 30,000. So they've been playing around with this. I, I, I'm happy that it's increased, but I think one of the rules that I do like is that they have. Um, you have the ability, if you short paid last year, let's say you only put in 20,000 instead of 25, that 5,000 can carry forward to this tax return. And that's one of the things that we're talking about when we're doing tax planning. To reduce tax, if you throw money into superannuation, it is tax deductible. So it increases your tax refund and your limit can be higher if you didn't contribute the full 25 the prior year. I'm in favour of that. Should mention, uh, Roy, we've got some great uh, guests coming up on the show. Andrew Kent from the Australian Landlord Association to join us soon, which brings us to our discussion on property. And I might add also, if you've got any questions, make sure you put them in the comments section. We'll be answering the questions for you as we go. But uh, property and the budget, what are some of the measures that uh, affect the property market and affect people, property owners, uh, that have come out of this budget? Well, the property um, market is being incentivised. I'm not sure it actually needs it, but it is being incentivised through this budget. The first home buyer, it's called New Home Guarantee, and a first home buyer can get into the market with a 5% deposit. Um, that doesn't mean that the government is giving him 15%. It means they're guaranteeing to the bank the other 15%, so he, doesn't, he or she doesn't need to pay lenders mortgage insurance. Um, and the family home guarantee is for single parents, another one that is predominantly female orientated, but it does affect male or female. And there's 10,000 spots and they can buy a property with only a 2% deposit and the gov government guarantee the 18% so lenders mortgage insurance is not paid. It's interesting you say there, you know, that, as you say, this is designed to give people who wouldn't ordinarily have access to the housing market access. But there is some interesting questions around prices there that, that come up. If you, you know, if people don't have enough capital um, to get into the housing market um, and the government's essentially backing, you know, backing their, their capital, then, you know, there's more people entering the economy. We know more demand means higher prices. Um, and perhaps it's, you know, it's a, um, it's a cycle that is going to be difficult to break um, because if prices go up, then less people can enter the market, which was the an original aim of this. So what, how do you see it playing out? Well, I I'm, I'm probably think this is more political than economical, in my opinion. I know it's just my opinion, and I'll get a lot of emails and comments to say I'm wrong, but the reality is um, there's a lot of media press about trying to help uh, sole parents and trying to help first home buyers. I know my parents didn't buy their first home until their mid-40s. But for some reason, we have evolved and we're now thinking that first home buyers should be buying homes in their mid-20s. And we're going to help them to do that. And these guarantees are trying to lower the costs. So I'm not 100% sure that they're economical because I don't believe the uh, property market needs to be incentivised right now. I actually would have held these both back for a little bit of time. Interesting. Well, 
we, as we do on this show every every uh, month when we have the show, we talk about our economic indicators and have a look at the economic outlook because one thing that we have achieved again is another spectacular high in consumer confidence, and and that's something that we talk about a lot on this show, Roy. It's at an 11 year high now, so. There was some concerns, uh, this is the April consumer confidence number, there were some concerns that with the end of JobKeeper, and geez, we've stopped talking about JobKeeper now, that's like a thing of the past, but that ended on the 31st of March. Um, we thought perhaps, you know, there might be a little bit of shakiness um, with the end of JobKeeper, but not to be. Consumer confidence increasing now at an 11 year high. I think this is amazing to think that we have come out of COVID and have this sort of consumer confidence um, this would be the highest in the world, it would be my prediction, because partly because we've got past COVID, everybody sees the economy bubbling along. Um, it'll be interesting to see what effect the state budget that's about to be released on Thursday with higher taxes, what that might do as we start to talk about wage growth and other things and what that might do. But um, I, I'm not I couldn't see what was going to knock consumer confidence around and my fear is it might actually be um, higher taxes. Mm. at state level mm. that might knock it around. Well, that'll be interesting and, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether the measures of the state show up in a national number like consumer confidence. But we've seen that, it, you know, if we just go back to that consumer confidence graph that we just saw a moment ago, we can see, as, a, as an example, that January number there was slightly lower than the December number and perhaps that was state-based because we know that WA went into some, some restrictions. We know that Queensland went into, into its own restrictions. We know that um, sometimes fires and bushfires and, and localised issues can affect the consumer confidence number. So, as you say, Roy, it will be interesting to watch the Victorian state budget and, and, uh, and potentially tax increases from that and, and whether they uh, affect the consumer confidence number. But we'll get to Roy's rage uh, later in the show. It's a hallmark of, of this show and we love it every week. But I do want to bring up a point, and I mentioned off the top, that uh, every budget we see the, uh, the budget number and then we see the forecasts and estimates. So let's have a look at some of the estimates uh, that are coming up for, or the forecasts that are coming up. Of course, real GDP, we see the budget one and a quarter. Of course, the next year, four and a quarter. Unemployment, or employment, we see uh, unemployment rate at five and a half. We see it going down to 5%, CPI going down, wage price index going up. So we see all of these, but what tends to happen, Roy, is that there is no accountability to these forecasted numbers. And we, we heard uh, famously the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, when delivering the 2019 2020, they had they had T-shirts printed, they had mugs printed, they had aprons printed, saying we're back in black, and they never ended up back in black. There was a pandemic, of course, that, that came along, and then there was a deficit. So let's have a look at what's happened with wage prices or wage growth, um, I should say, annual wage growth over the journey. We see 15, 16 budget. Look, wage wage growth is uh, predicted to increase. Um, there's the trajectory, never eventuated. 16, 17, never eventuated. 17, 18, never eventuated. Now, it, I, I believe that governments need to be held further to you know further to account on these numbers because the forecast never eventuates. This is Dave's rage. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's not happy that the governments will make a forecast and just can't achieve it. Interesting though. If they're forecasting wage growth to be uh, quite high, uh, the next thing after wage growth will be inflation, I would think. Well, yeah, th that, that is um, one of the things that could be brought about by wage growth, but also by historically low interest rates as well. And if we have a look at um, some of the, the interest rates that we've seen, um, you know, this is the long look at interest rates over the last 25 years you can see just how historically low they are. We, heard, we hear that um, time and time again, historically low interest rates. Now, Roy, you've been, um, you've been um, put on the record about the, the Reserve Bank um, coming out and saying they're going to fix interest rates and the potential issues that can stem from that. But let's have a look at inflation. Um, it has bounced around and there's, you know, there's perhaps no correlation um, in these graphs, but and this is a 25-year look as well, perhaps no correlation between inflation and interest rates. But it is a watch this space because if we do have wage growth and if we do have historically low interest rates and we, we know from um, before that the deficit has increased, so there's more money in the economy, we're putting more money in people's pockets, the 1080 for the middle income, all of that, 
you know, this is the this is the the the, the interesting one. Will, what will happen with inflation? Well, the Reserve Bank have said they will not change interest rates until 2024. And the thing is that Australia is leading the world in coming out of COVID. Our economy is leading the world. And it would be unlikely that Australia by themselves would lower interest... Uh, sorry, increase interest rates and nobody else in the world does. If you look at our interest rate graphs, we follow overseas countries quite often. And if we were the only ones to increase our interest rates, there would be a, a run on the Australian dollar because people would want to invest in Australia. So I think holding back until 2024, I believe the Reserve Bank, when they've told us that's what they're going to do. I believe that's what they will do. So it will be interesting to see how we retain inflation if we do have wage growth. Just for context for people that are watching that, you know, precede that 25-year uh, graph, because that, that graph shows what inflation has been like the last 25 years, but there were massive problems with inflation well before that in the 1980s and, and, and before that. You know, what does that look like? Oh, they... The economists of the day, back when I was a younger, a younger accountant, um, <laughs> they couldn't work out why they had inflation so high and interest rates so high because they were trying to balance one off the other and it wasn't top ring. Inflation was just not decreasing. And it was actually an economic con conundrum at the time on why is this not working to the standard things that they taught in our universities. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. So watch this space. Uh, we mentioned property... Uh before and the effects of the budget. And uh, we've talked about property on this show on a number of occasions, and particularly in the context of changes to legislation in the Victorian space. Uh, and it's great to welcome Andrew Kent from the Australian Landlord Association. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks for having me. Andrew, there's lots of new regulation that is pushing responsibility from tenants to landlords. In summary, what are some of the major changes that you're seeing around the country? Uh, so look, this legislation is happening state by state and I, I think it's happened first in Victoria or mainly uh, certainly been led by Victoria. And I guess the summary of it is that we're seeing the rights of ownership to well, tenants getting the rights of ownership without the responsibility of ownership. And in some cases, the ownership on landlords is increasing. So it's certainly skewed things quite a bit um, in terms of what rights uh, tenants now have in, in terms of their property. Um, so things that have traditionally been excluded from tenants' rights um, without the landlord approval are things like um, whether or not they can have pets in the house, um, whether or not they can uh, paint the walls different colours, um, whether they can make other alterations to the house. So there are now much looser or a great deal more rights being given to the tenants in Victoria in relation to what they can do in the property while we're there. Um, and I guess a main concern we have is that those increases in rights have not come with any increase in security for the landlord should some of those things um, go astray. So, um, you know, for example, they the tenant might decide to paint the room pink. Um, under the legislation, they should return that to the state it was before taking out the uh, tenancy. But if they don't, you're still only looking at your one month bond to try and recuperate that or going through the courts to try and get that money back. Um, so yeah, it's certainly um, a significant skew in favour of the tenant, which um, we are, um, you know, are, are pushing against or pushing back on. Andrew, we've spoken a number of times about some legislation that's changed when you have a landlord in one state and a tenant in another. Um, just give me a quick rundown on what, what those are and how it affects our, our owners. OK, so this, this is actually a high court... Of, is, is a, a side effect, I guess, from a 2018 high court decision, um, which was actually uh, more... In, it wasn't actually a property-related decision. It was actually in related to a, a family matter, but... In that decision, it was ruled that um, the various state authorities, so in Victoria, it's VCAT, um, do not have the right to um, rule on a dispute between people who are from different states. So if a landlord is um, outside of Victoria, even though the property is in Victoria and even though the dispute relates to that property in Victoria, because they live outside Victoria, the High Court ruling has basically said that they can no longer... Um, and they were okay up until 2018. They can no longer use 
what is the standard method of, of tenancy dispute um, or standard legal channel for that to resolve that. Now, the only state that, and so this is a national issue, so it's across all states, the only state that has attempted to bring that back into some sort of balance is South Australia. Now, they haven't actually got around, they haven't changed the rule as such, but what they have put in place is um, if you're an interstate landlord with property in South Australia, you can um, basically flag with the with um, SACAT or um, the South Australian equivalent of, of VCAT, you can flag with them that you are an interstate landlord and you basically get, um, you get your court, your dispute heard in the magistrate's court under the the same um, policies and, and processes as would have happened um, under the um, SACAT um, ruling. Now, the fact that South Australia has done that um, and did that very quickly um, is something that we're trying to get all of the other states to do. And we're also um, in the process of talking to or trying to get in touch with the Federal Housing Minister um, to try and get this resolved um, at a national level, because I think it is an unintended consequence of a ruling, a high court ruling, and um, it doesn't really make any sense to anybody. Um, so, particularly, as it, it doesn't actually apply to international. So, international uh, property owners can still go through VCAT, but interstate ones can't. And we just think that's a, a bit of a nonsense and needs to be uh, re looked at. So, a Victorian landlord who's purchased in Queensland, of which I've got many clients have done so, is there only a way to ha fix a dispute? to take it to the Supreme Court. That's correct. And, and one of our members um, who had a similar thing but in New South Wales actually spent $50,000 on legal costs um, to, to um, get his, um, his case with his tenant um, through, through the New South Wales courts. And it also takes longer. So it's not only more expensive, it takes longer. Um, and it's, it's just something that needs to be addressed very quickly and, and we're pushing hard to, to make that happen. Andrew, you've spoken about some of the litigious issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that affect the, the property market and the courts and the, you know, obviously the costs associated with that. And also we've just come off the federal budget where a number of measures are national measures that affect the, the housing prices or the housing market, housing prices, people's super. You know, how much of your job with the Australian Landlords Association is trying to nationalise measures and standardise things when housing and, and these issues are, are things that are affecting the country as a whole? Um, well, we're not, certainly not, we're not trying to um, influence the housing market overall. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the housing market at the moment is um, that it is going up despite the absence of property investors. So property investors have historically been blamed for um, you know, sort of uh, peaks in the housing market. So I think at least we can put that, um, that one to bed that it's not property investors that are the ones driving, um, driving the cost of housing in Australia. I think it always comes back to supply and demand. And if you sort of look at what's happened in Australia um, at the moment, um, some of the biggest increases are due to... Um, changes in where people are trying to live and in, in WA, so the, the, the sort of hottest market, I guess, is Perth, um, you know, across the country. And, and part of that is that the Western Australian government have effectively put a ban on the fly-in, fly-out mining um, thing, saying that they have to stay in the state when they're not there. So the rental market in Perth um, is, is totally overheated and that, that's flowing into the property market there. Um, but we... You know, our overall thing is that the market should take care of itself. Um, the minimum government interventions are, would be a good thing. Andrew, we have a state government uh, budget release later this week, and as is normal, they release secretly some things that might be in it. Are you across some of the things that have been touted that may be in the budget? Uh, look, one of the things that we're, we're across, and certainly we're not across all of it, and, and as you said, Roy, sometimes they leak these things to see, you know, what sort of reaction they get before they... Um, get round to making them official or not official. So, um, you know, certainly um, this particular Victorian government, so the Andrews government, has a history of of bumping up land tax quite significantly. So every time they put a budget out, they've bumped up the land tax again and, and also reduced, um, reduced where it cuts in. So um, the value of the land that it applies to comes down and the amount of tax um, that, you know, is being applied goes up. 
So that's been um, mooted as happening again. Um, I won't be at all surprised if it does happen again because their Victorian budget is well out of balance and they're looking um, for places to grab money from and, and this seems probably an easy win for them. Um, but it's certainly not, not related to any... Um, there's no benefit coming back the other way to those who are paying more tax. It's not that they're saying, you know, pay more tax and get this back. There's absolutely no benefit. It's just a money grab. Uh, interestingly, from what we're getting, what we've read, is that land tax will go up between 13% and 19%. Um, do you think that's going to have much effect on continuing to push away developers or property investors? Because the things you spoke about right at the start are just adding costs to landlords and these additional taxes in Victoria are adding more costs. What are your thoughts around that? Uh, certainly um, part of what we're hearing from our members is that... Um, you know, it's it's less appealing to, to be a, um, you know, a, a traditional landlord now. And, and bear in mind that as much as people think that the landlords are, you know, sort of a wealthy elite, um, there's actually two over two million individual landlords in Australia, and most of them only own one property. Um, and so, and it's often um, tradies and, and, and so forth who would go into this who don't understand the share or aren't comfortable in the share market, understand the property market and, and just trying to build some wealth for their future. So getting back um, into to your question, Roy, is um, I think it's it's quite interesting that as these, um, you know, uh, governments are pushing for or making it less appealing to be um, property owner, property investors and, and, and landlords, they're also needing to invest heavily in, in um, social housing. Um, and those two things are not unrelated. They've ramped up the risk significantly on becoming a property in, in owning property, particularly at um, at the higher risk, which is the sort of lower socioeconomic area. They've they've ramped the risk up on landlords and the cost up on landlords, and so landlords are getting out of the market. And so therefore, people who can't afford to buy a house aren't able to rent one because um, of the change in the legislation. So now they're turning around and saying, "Well, we need to build housing." Well. If they didn't change the rules the way they did, they wouldn't need to build the houses. Andrew, we've seen uh, measures in New Zealand that are designed to push property prices down. What uh, is your outlook for, I suppose, uh, federally for, for Australia? Do you ever see a, a, a federal government potentially looking to push property prices down? And, and what, what's the risk with that that you see? I think that that was attempted a few years ago, um, you know, when they put restrictions on um, you know, who could buy property and so forth and, and property prices did take a dip and then that was seen to be extremely unpopular because um, the vast majority of Australian um, wealth is actually tied up in their house or in property. Um, so I think it's, it's political suicide to take measures to reduce the price of housing. Um, so I think what we'll see is more measures like we're seeing at the moment federally where they're trying to increase um, the affordability of housing by increasing the amount of income available or, or reducing the cost of first home ownership. Um, so I don't, I can't foresee when um, there'll be government measures to try and reduce um, housing prices in the future. I think that that's been attempted and, and won't be attempted again. Um, I think we'll, we'll continue to see um, various uh, political measures to try and um, make housing look more affordable to, to the next generation. Um, but I, I'm not going to predict what those measures might be. Andrew, um, the Australian Landlord Association membership is tax deductible. I've been asked that question by your members from time to time. Um, just briefly, tell us what the association does and what it costs to become a member. Uh, so it's, it's $175 a year, although, um, you know, we do have some associate uh, rates. So um, if, if you're actually a client of RJ Sanderson, um, as one of our associate partners, it's $150 a year. Um, and with that, you get access to our um, helpline. We, uh, you, get, um, you help support us represent landlords um, with the government. Um, but yeah, we, the, I guess the key, key benefit of membership is we keep you informed of what's going on. And um, should an issue arise, you, you can um, phone, the, phone us and, and raise the issue and, and we'll help you with that. Um, so that's, I guess, a very short version of, of what it is. But there's more details on the Australian um, Landlords Association website, which is 
australianlandlords.com.au. Andrew, uh, thanks so much for your time today on RJ Sanderson TV. Thank you for having me. Andrew Kent there from the Australian Landlord Association. Now, some interesting thoughts, Roy, and uh, you can see that he's obviously uh, very passionate and some, some, some issues that uh, probably went a little bit over my head, but um, so there's uh, some, some very passionate advocacy there on his yeah. part. Look, I, I would encourage um, everybody, if you've got a property, I would join the association, Australian Landlords Association. It is tax deductible and you actually get free advice. So you can ring them and get advice. And, and I know we're on the panel to give people who ring their office to give free uh, tax advice. So it can be very economical if you do join. Right, sit down, sit back, strap yourself in. It's time for Roy's Rage, as we do every time on RJ Sanderson TV. Roy, what has got your blood boiling today? Well, we touched on this a little while ago, and it's the fact that the government are guaranteeing 18% of a sole parent's loan. And it's male or female, but the reality is what the government is saying is that it's OK to go out and borrow 98% of your purchase price. And I don't think that's good economics. I don't think it's sensible for anybody to borrow 98%. I understand we have this desire to get into our own property and not pay rent. But the reality is, you're on thin ice. If you have your hours cut back at work, that could be diabolical. Um, if something changes, if interest rates do go up in 2024, as expected, then how does that affect you? So I would hope that anybody who's going to borrow 98% is doing a little bit of homework and are setting up some sort of <coughs> safety net. That safety net might be parents, might be friends, or it might be a, some nest egg that you've got that you can call on if really need be. But 98% purchase price annoys me somewhat. We've got a, we've got a little slide to, to demonstrate some of those numbers, Roy, um, because you know the, the difference um, can be enormous. Yes, and this, this is to show, because we do loans and we're, RJS Loan Solutions is our sister company, and I asked the team to put together what the differences are. So this attempts to show that why you should use a broker. If you went to a broker, um, they get access to many lenders. And here, if you have one child, uh, one bank might lend you 529000 but a different bank might lend you 467000 when you go through those numbers, the difference can be fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So, bank A being more aggressive, bank B being more conservative. Um, my fear is that people will overcommit. Interest rates go up in two thousand and twenty-four, and that's what scares me. And we're not just talking about we're talking about a sole parent here trying to bring up a family um, with children or child, and it just does worry me that. The government have put out a policy that suggests it's OK to borrow 98%. And that, I don't think, is a good policy for the long term. Oh, I think you, I think you need to, to cool down, uh, Roy, after your rage. And, you know, what better way to cool down than with the man from Sanitaire Healthy Air Conditioning? And that is Mahen Raj Kumar. Mahen, thanks for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Thank you. Mahen, tell us a little bit more about what Sanitaire do. Look, we clean air conditioners, and it's something that a lot of people don't realise that we need to get onto, especially coming into winter. We're going to use them a lot more for heating than cooling in Victoria. So it's a very good time to get your air cons clean out. And it's not just the filters. We clean the coils, the air well, the fan, and get rid of all the moulds and bacteria in your machine. So you've got healthier air. Mahan, we've spoken today with um, somebody from the Australian Landlords Association and we talked about the amount of obligations being put on landlords through recent, very recent legislation. Have you had any impact in your business yet as far as landlords stepping up and saying, I need to get this done for a tenant? No, not yet. We do have a few landlords that will get it done, but it's, it's still not out there yet for people to understand what they need to get done. When you go out and you um, clean and sanitise an air conditioning unit, does somebody, does the landlord or the owner of the property get any sort of certificate to say it's done and it's hygienic? For sure, we can provide a certificate to show what we've done and we provide a 12-month guarantee as well on mould. 
Now, Hen, uh, COVID came along and uh, there was lots of tales of, uh, of COVID sort of shifting through people's air conditioners, particularly in hotel quarantine, etc. Um, have you noticed a general sort of uh, change in people's attitudes towards their, their health and in particular your niche on healthy air conditioning? I don't think it's really helped my business. People aren't aware yet how important for quality of air what, what, what are some of the things that you want to make them aware of today? Uh, what, why should people get their air conditioners serviced and, and, uh, and, and maintained in that way? What are some of the things that that can prevent? Look, first of all, quality of air. Then the machine is going to perform better, which means working more efficiently, costs less to run, and the machine doesn't overwork to heat or cool your house. Mahan, not wanting to put you on the spot, but what does it cost for a, a normal sanitised and premium clean for an average householder? The average price is $169. And do you have any sort of gauge, Mahan, on how much someone can save from having a, a clean air conditioner? Look, we've got figures up to 28% on a cleaner air conditioner. And how, how, how often or how frequently should people be cleaning their air conditioners? We suggest yearly for those who are using them quite frequently. It, it really depends on the amount of use, but a yearly is a good gauge. Just before we let you go, Mahen, how can people get in contact uh, with you if they want to get their air conditioner service? So we've got sanitaire.com.au for our website and also free call on 1-800-130-168. Mahen Rajkumar, thank you so much for joining us uh, on RJ Sanderson TV. Thank you to you guys. Thanks, Mahen. Um, I'm quite amazed. I can tell you this, Dave. If I bought a new house, I would actually have it, the air conditioning system cleaned because you just don't know what's in there. Oh, absolutely. And particularly with uh, the spread of, uh, you know, we, we've, um, we've had the... Um, cold and flu type symptoms uh, circulating our house and perhaps, you know, perhaps we have to look in our air conditioner to, to get it out of the, the house, um, you know, with the, the focus on health that we've seen of late. I think it's a, an important message. Uh, Roy, that's just about all we've got time for on RJ Sanderson TV. Uh, the Victorian budget, that's coming up. Uh, what are some of your thoughts uh, on that uh, ahead of it and expectations for that? Well, if what they've leaked, in, which includes um, tax rises, payroll, um, payroll tax, possibly land tax, almost definitely, I'll be very disappointed because it's a, a, it's a horrible tax. Um, so I, we need to wait and see. But uh, certainly we'll probably be discussing that at the next show. And Patrick Cripps, is he, is he injured or, you know, what's uh, going on there? He's past that injury. He's all fine now. He's all fired up. He's ready to yep. go. OK, so we're both there. Essendon and Carlton, both three and six uh, going into uh, the next month. We'll see where we're at next time on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you've had fun tonight.